hit record. Oops, all right, hold on. Need to make sure I can see you, Sarah. All right. Hello, hello and welcome. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Divya Kakkad. I'm the um, head of platform at Graham and Walker. Um, and we are here today uh, talking to Sarah Moray, uh, the founder and CEO of Curie. Um, we'd love to hear where you are dialing in from. So use the chat, introduce yourself. Uh, and tell us where you're listening in from. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, Graham and Walker is a venture firm on a mission to reshape the NASDAQ by supporting and investing in tomorrow's most powerful companies. Uh, we do these forums uh, once every month. We try and um, invite female founders that are inspirational, doing something really cool, building uh, awesome companies uh, like Sarah here. Uh, and investors. So, you know, if you're on our newsletter, you um, uh, probably have been um, to some of these before. Um, I'm going to go in and introduce Sarah. Uh, so Sarah launched Curie in 2018 with $12,000 from her own pocket after she struggled to find an all-natural aluminum-free deodorant that actually worked. Since then, the brand has quickly grown a cult following and can be found in over 300 stores nationwide, including Nordstrom and uh, Anthropology. Curie's mission is to give all women the confidence to accomplish their dreams and feel good about themselves by providing simple but important hygiene products to live healthier lives. If you registered for today's forum, um, you submitted questions for Sarah and um, I've used some of those to inform uh, today's discussion. And we'll obviously uh, also open it up for Q&A. Um, so feel free to keep putting in questions in the chat and I'll try to weave them in as we have this conversation or address them uh, at the end. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, excited to chat. Yeah, let's, um, let's start right at the beginning. Tell us, you know, tell us what made you start Curie? Yeah, so I, um, I actually worked in venture capital um, for, almost five years before I started my company. Um, worked at a fund, tech-focused fund in the Bay Area, um, and then moved down to LA and joined a consumer-focused fund. I was an investment associate. I was in my 20s. It was a very fun job. My job was basically to meet with founders every day and listen to their big ideas of how they're going to change the world. Um, and it was a really fun and inspiring job. Um, but because I was one of the few female venture capital like investors in LA at the time, um, a lot of like the health and beauty and wellness companies that were really becoming more mainstream. This was like 2016, 2017, when, you know, Goop launched Beauty Counter, like all these, um, these companies that we know and love today um, were coming to the forefront and they were coming and pitching me because I was a female and I would, I was their target market and they knew I would get it. And so I kind of fell into this industry. I was never a beauty junkie at all. I would buy, you know, a vino lotion from CVS and secret deodorant. And I would buy, you know, cover girl cosmetics. Like I did not, um, give a crap about what the ingredients I was putting on my body were, but of course I like, you know, paid attention to the food I was eating, but never put, drew the connection that your skin actually is your biggest organ. It absorbs everything that you put on it. Um, I'm spending all this money on organic fruits and vegetables at Whole Foods. Why am I putting these toxic chemicals on my body? So it was um, kind of an aha moment that kind of fell into my lap. And I started making all the, making the switch to all these cleaner, um, more natural products, not necessarily natural, but not toxic. That was really my goal. Um, and that really is the goal of our customers too. We're not a natural brand. We're a clean brand, which means we have nothing against lab made or synthetic ingre ingredients that are perfectly safe for you and your body. Um, we just are trying to avoid using chemicals that can be, you know, endocrine disrupting, cancer causing, um, you know, aluminum, which clogs your clogs your sweat glands and has all these studies that have shown that it might not do great things long-term to your body. And so that was ultimately um, my goal. And I could not find an aluminum free deodorant that worked for me. I tried everything. I'm an athlete. I'm a runner. Um, at the time I was running marathons and I was just like, go, 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 go all the time. And 
I wasn't, I didn't care that much that I was going to smell <laughs> all day long just to use an aluminum free deodorant. And so I kept just going back to my secret antiperspirant. Um, and that was, um, that was about the time I had hit my two year mark at the fund that I was at. And I was like, you know, now or never this, I've always wanted to start something. This is an idea I can't stop thinking about. Um, and so I went for it and started Curie, um, despite having all the connections in venture capital, I bootstrapped because I really just wanted to prove, um, you know, prove that there was a market for this product, um, before where I went all in. So I bootstrapped and ran Curie actually as a side hustle for the entire first year. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. well, tell us a little bit about the name. Yeah, it's named after Marie Curie, um, Madame Curie, who was a famous physicist and scientist um, in the 1800s. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize and the only person to win the Nobel Prize in two different sciences. Um, she made some like groundbreaking discoveries, you know, which led to the um, invention of chemotherapy, of radiation therapy, x-rays, like all these amazing discoveries in a time when women weren't even getting an education. So she was truly a trailblazer um, and had, you know, a wonderful marriage and kids who went on to be Nobel Prize winners themselves. So she just, to me, was the epitome of like, that trailblazer badass like woman that I aspired to be and that um kind of represents you know who a lot of our customers are a lot of our customers are moms or you know women that are out there building careers and juggling family and um trying to do it all and that's um that's kind of a, a nod um Marie Curie the name Marie Curie is kind of a nod to that I love that so much I mean <laughs> uh, we are named after or Raman Walker is uh, named after, you know, women in history. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. Very, very proud of. And um, I love that as a beauty company, you're named after a scientist. I, I think that's super cool. Um, so when did you know, uh, you know, you said you told us a little bit about why you thought this was uh, a product that needed to be uh, made, but when did you know you had a winning product at hand? Like, did, can you tell us a little bit about the early traction you had or how did you test yeah. Um, how did that come about? It's funny because like it's very, very humble origins. Like I was working full time. So Curie was again my side hustle nights and weekends. Um, not only was I working full time, I was traveling like crazy. So it was um there, I have some really funny stories. Like one day I want to start a podcast. It's like the bootstrap diaries and like talk about all the ridiculous things I did, like carrying a suitcase full of deodorant on business trips with me so I could like fulfill orders out of my hotel room, like crazy stuff like that. But um, I mean, I was my first customer, like I, I'm pretty sweaty and like I've I've always struggled with that um I remember in high school getting my first like internship um at like a doctor's office as a you know front doctor and I remember driving to work with like the air conditioner like blasting on my arm on my armpits with my hands up on the steering wheel because I would get like so sweaty <laughs> so I was my first customer and I knew that if I created something that worked for me um, it would likely work for other people as well. Um, and so that made it easy. I, I found um, an amazing chemist just on LinkedIn um, who we worked with to create our first formula. We've since modified it, but um, our first formula took us almost 10 months to create. I was like, I wasn't in any major hurry and I figured I'm, I'm not going to launch something that I, that doesn't work for me. You know, like it has to be great in order for me to actually go through the effort, put my money behind this. Um, so we tr probably tried like 20 to 25 different formulas, went back and forth, back and forth, made some modifications. Um, and then when it worked on me, I was obviously like elated. It was like so exciting. I remember just like jumping up and down um, because it, it, we had struggled to find something that had the right consistency that didn't give me like a rash, but also worked well enough. And finally, when we got it, I was so pumped and shared it with all my friends and family and had other people test it out as well. And then um, that was when we launched. So before you, before, I mean, before, even before you uh, appeared on Shark Tank, your products were already sold in over, over 300 stores. Mm -hmm. um, 
I know that you had a partnership with Soul Cycle. I read something about, you know, you talked about QVC right before this. That's super impressive. Like that's not easy for a DTC company to go from, okay, you know, launch a product um, and then get that kind of distribution. So how did you break into these retailers or what advice do you have for founders that are, you know, in that product stage have something that they think can do well, but how do you get it in, you know? Yeah, it's, it's pretty like unconventional. Um, we like most companies were struggling with retail during 2020 and we actually got into retail in 2020. Um, but I'll kind of explain why. So we coming into the pandemic, we were a hundred percent direct to consumer. We had just our deodorant stick, deodorant spray, and that was it. And then, um, in 2020 with COVID people stopped buying deodorant. Like it was a noticeable, like once the lockdown started, it was like nosedive, like our sales declined and it was like really, really stressful and scary um, because people were staying at home and I guess weren't wearing deodorant. I was, but um, I guess a lot of people weren't. And so uh, we quickly had to figure out what we were going to do because um, at the time, all we sold was deodorant. And so that kind of pushed us to launch our next product quicker than we were going to. Hand sanitizer was always on the horizon, but, um, and we had actually already made the formula. We just weren't planning to launch it for another year because we were going to launch with SoulCycle in April. So mm-hmm. this like in January of 2020, we were like, all right, we're going to launch a soul cycle in April with our spray deodorant. And then end of year, we'll unveil our hand sanitizer and we'll put that in the studios as well. Um, but with COVID, hand sanitizer obviously was in high demand and we moved up the timeline and hustled to get um, our first batch of hand sanitizer made like probably seven months before we had planned and launched that in May of 2020. Um, And that saved us. Like 2020 was the year of hand sanitizer. We sold hundreds of thousands of bottles of hand sanitizer in in that year. And it really saved us because I, I, it took, it, it wasn't until 2021 that deodorant sales were covered. And so we had this beautiful hand sanitizer I usually have my products at my desk, but oh, wait, I actually do have a hand sanitizer. Um, We had this beautiful hand sanitizer that was me, you know, it's much nicer looking than your Purell. It's made with hyaluronic acid and prickly pear seed oil. So it's like skincare. (laughs) People's hands were dry. A lot of hand sanitizer was like smelling like cheap tequila. And we had something premium that smelled amazing and made your hands also feel really soft. And so the retailers that we had been dying to get into, like I had reached out to Nordstrom like, five times and gotten no's every time. This so all these COVID. retailers before COVID, yeah. yeah the and so all these retailers that I'd been like dying to get into were like knocking on our door, um, asking us if they could put the hand sanitizer in wow. all their stores. And I was like, yes. Um, so we got, ended up getting into all the Nordstrom stores, Bloomingdale's and Anthropology all in like a three month time span, end of 2020 which was so, so funny. And like, I, um, anyone that asked me for advice, I'm like, don't ask me. Cause it was very just right place, right time. Um, I had a great product that met the need, um, of, of these retailers and we got in all their doors and that got us in the door literally and figuratively where now our hand sanitizer sales are re- a really small percentage of our sales, like probably less than 5% of our total sales are hand sanitizer at this point. I think everyone's kind of over it, over hand sanitizer in general. Um, and you can buy it on like discount at Target for like 50 cents now, cause there's like, there was way too much supply. So um, the retailers are now all carrying the rest of our line. So Nordstrom- and That was your sort of step in the door. It was my foot in the door and then now they sell our deodorant and our body wash. And so it, um, it was kind of a perfect scenario where we had this little like carrot and that got them to bite. And then now, um, our full line is sold with them. But there's all, there is such a great lesson here though, right? I mean, you had your hero product that you were trying to go and sell, but you were listening to the market. And the moment you know that knew that COVID hit, you were able to sort of pivot 
quickly enough and use that as an opportunity to sort of keep your company alive, get in, get a foot in the door. So, um, I mean, like, I mean, we had to, like, there was no, no sure. it was not even a question. Like we wouldn't have survived if we hadn't done that. Um, yeah. so it was just like a great example of being a nimble startup. Like if we were a giant, like legacy deodorant company, yeah. um, I don't know, like we wouldn't have been able to move as fast as we did, but we were small. We were, you know, a small team of, I think three people at the time, like we were just, um, we just hopped on that. And I was on the phone till 4am some nights, like trying to get bottles from China because it was impossible to get bottles. So I was calling, like, begging suppliers to like, just let us buy some bottles. Like it was, it was definitely like a very, um, a very like, it was, it was dire circumstances because the business was like, you know, our, our, our revenue had declined by so much, but it was also like fun. Like it was like a really fun time because it was COVID. We were all like lonely and like, it was scary and sad. And I had this like mission in front of me and my team and I like rallied and we were like, so just pumped on this. And we ended up giving away, um, half of our first production run. We let people, we created this like landing page on our website where people could nominate first responders, like not even like first responder, like medical, but also teachers, anyone that was still working, delivery workers, you could nominate them and we would send them, um, free, free hand sanitizer. So we, it was also just like a great mission, um, that we all got to just like rally behind and it made those first few months of COVID like more bearable for all of us. Wow. So, I mean, you talked about the distribution piece, but marketing and media, it's also something you, you have been doing really well. Uh, I, it's also perhaps one of the most important levels for a consumer brand to get that right. Um, how would, how do you think about this as a early stage founder? And do, do you remember a particular moment where you felt like you had a tipping point? from a media perspective? To be honest, no, I still feel like we're figuring it out. Um, we, my whole like strategy since the beginning was just like dig, like go find the little like places that no one else is. And like, that's basically what we're still doing. So for example, like, you know, everyone was spending on when we launched, I, at least now the conversation shifted a bit, but at the time it was like, everyone was spending on Facebook, 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 like that was the whole strategy for all these businesses. And, you know, we're operating in a competitive space, like deodorant, skincare in general, body care, like that's a very competitive market. And so we could never compete on Facebook and Instagram. Like everyone else would always have better better creative, better targeting, better, bigger budgets. And we were competing against these giant marketing budgets and we weren't winning. And so I was like, rather than like trying to compete on this, like, let's find our little thing that no one else is doing. Maybe it's going to be a little bit more work, but maybe we could find customers easier. Um, if we look over here and everyone else is looking over here. Um, and so for example, the fitness studios is, mm -hmm. is a, prime example of that. Um, I met with SoulCycle through a friend of a friend in like 2019. Um, and, uh, the, the woman who I spoke with at SoulCycle was like, Hey, I, our, our operations team is actually looking for an aluminum free deodorant spray to replace the antiperspirant spray that's in our bathrooms, in our locker rooms, in the studios. If you guys like, are planning to do a spray deodorant, let me know. Like we'd, I'd love to like send them samples. And so I got our manufacturer to like, or our um, chemist to create a formula for us. Um, and within like four months, we had a great formula. We just used the same active ingredients as our deodorant, put them in spray form and sent them samples. Boom. Like that's how soul cycle happened. Um, and the strategy with soul cycle was like, let's put our deodorant spray in these places where people need it most like fitness studios um, let them use it for free and then convert them to customers it's kind of like a sampling program uh, where you go into soul cycle oh what's this like curie deodorant spray and then spritz spritz and you're like oh this smells amazing oh it really works and then 
you know, we give them a discount code or in the studios, we have QR codes that lead to our website to make it really seamless and easy to make a purchase. And so now we're in hundreds of fitness studios. We're actually um, launching with one of the biggest fitness chains um, in, uh, in June. And that's a huge part of our marketing right now is acquiring those people in, um, in fitness studios. And it's, it's a great strategy for us because it's, it's not crowded. Like there's only one deodorant in the bathrooms. There's only one deodorant in the locker rooms and it's ours. And so we don't have to compete for eyeballs like we do on Facebook, you know, we do, we do still spend on Facebook, but it's, just, it's not like our only strategy. It's not our biggest, um, uh, marketing budget, you know, right I now. Love that. I love that. It's such a, such Thank a you. smart way to think about how to get in front of your customer. Like you're constantly competing. And so where, where is your customer spending time where you can find them exactly where i mean a fitness studio is exactly where they're going to be sweating they're going to be thinking about this they're going to need that they're going to go somewhere else after this yeah. um that is so smart so clever um thank you moving moving you know switching gears a little tell us um you said you bootstrapped uh, your company um and you also said that you worked for abc firm in your earlier life so tell us a little bit about your funding uh, fundraising journey. Did you feel like you were prepared for fundraising because you knew kind of what to expect? Um, yeah. Yeah. So we actually haven't done um, a formal round. Um, we, I started the company, bootstrapped it for that first year. Mm -hmm. And then when I left my job and started working on Curie full-time um, in 20, end of 2019, um, we raised a convertible note, a couple hundred thousand dollars, um, mostly like friends, family, angel investors, um, a couple like small, you know, individual investors. Um, and yeah, so we, that's all we've raised, um, that closed in January of 2020. So for the last two years, we've been totally bootstrapped. Um, no, we haven't raised any additional capital and, I'm definitely leaving the door open. Um, we'll potentially raise more down the line, but right now we're profitable and I don't feel super constrained. Um, so we haven't done a formal seed round or series A round. Um, and I, I imagine that will come, but it'll probably be when we have like something, something big that like we really need that capital for, for example, if we launch with like a Target or a Walmart or a CVS, um, we might go out and raise, but we haven't done um, a formal round yet. So, I mean, this is the perfect segue to talk about Shark Tank. Um, so mm -hmm. you, I read uh, that you, you said that you manifested this. I'm very <laughs> curious to hear that whole story. Do you follow uh, my TikTok? <laughs> I, I mean, I may, I may have stalked you uh, in the last few <laughs> days, but no, I definitely, I want to hear the story, and then of course tell us um, how that played into, uh, you know, what made you apply, what made you think that you were a, a, a good story, good candidate, good founder to be featured there, and then um, I also want to hear a little bit about uh, how you, th how that's helped the business take, being there, like the success after. Yeah. Um... So yeah, my TikTok is full of uh, store Shark Tank stories. It's like really working for us right now. <laughs> so um, we Shark Tank was um, honestly two years in the making. I originally applied in 2019, didn't get on the show. And then, or no, I applied in 2020, didn't get on the show. And then the producer um, that I had been working with encouraged me to apply again. She's like, you know, timing is everything, like just apply again next year. And so I applied again in 2021 and ended up getting on the show. Went but you literally applied like through the website, just- Yeah. Through. Okay. Yeah. Um, just it's Shark Tank is actually, I really admire the show. Like I have great, only great things to say about just how they run and operate. Like it, they don't allow you to- 
get like a warm introduction through a friend to a producer, like they won't let you get on the show that way. Or like, if you reach out to one of the sharks and you have any communication with one of the sharks, like Mark Cuban can't help you get on the show. You'll get disqualified. Like if you even talk to them. So it is kind of like, I do respect them for how they really make it a level playing field. Your connections don't matter. Like you doesn't matter who you are. You're applying through the website. You're going to a casting call, or sometimes they'll, they do outreach and they'll reach out to you, but, um, there's no like favors, which I really like that, um, about them and it create it like preserves the integrity of the show. But I, so I applied online, I reapplied in 2021, um, and then got an audition again, did the same thing that I done, you know, you submit a video and then this time I got on this show. And so that the process of like prep preparing for shark tank is like a part-time job. Like, I think I found out in March of, of last year that I got on the show, that I was going to be on the season. Um, and then from there, it's like uh, every week you're like doing something for the show, whether you're writing your little minute pitch that you do at the beginning, or you're, you have to, the entrepreneurs, the companies have to design the set and like buy everything for the set. So that was a whole thing. Like you have this, it's just a lot of work preparing for Shark Tank. Um, so that was like pretty much my whole summer last year was um, getting ready for Shark Tank, getting prepped. And then I ended up filming in um, September of 2019. And then my episode just aired March 11th. So it was basically a full year from learning I was going to be on the show to my, my episode airing. So what made you apply to Shark Tank? What did you expect to get out of it? And um... yeah, so I, um, my, and I mentioned this in my, and you, you might be referencing the blog post the manifestation thing was mm-hmm. um, my mom and I used to watch Shark Tank together and she, um, I was like in college. Um, I, I didn't really like love school like at all in like elementary school high school like I I basically forced myself to like do well so that I wouldn't get in trouble but like I never was really into school and then I went to college and was in uh, the business program at Boston University and doing really really well I was like top of my class and I just like loved school like so interested it was always raising my hand like I was just found my thing. And my mom was like really proud and like excited. And I remember I came home for like Christmas or something and we were watching Shark Tank and um, there was some like girl pitching and she's like, honey, that could be you. Like you could do that. And I was like, you're right. Like I could. (laughs) And so I joked that my mom manifested Shark Tank for me like 15 years ago. uh, Cause I was like, oh yeah, like I could do that. I'm in, I'm getting a degree in business. Like I could start a company one day and be on Shark Tank. And so, um, I've always been a fan of Shark Tank. Obviously I'm, I have a, a lot of friends, like a network of entrepreneurs that have been on this show before. So I knew that it was like, very, um, had a huge impact on their companies. And so that was the main reason I wanted to go on Shark Tank, being honest. Um, but I, it's hard to get on the show. And so I went through the process and then we got on and then we ended up, I never imagined that I would be walking away with a deal and for things to turn out how they have, like, it's been a wild experience. Can you tell us how uh, it's affected the business uh, yeah. coming out of the show? And obviously, yeah, I mean, we, we, we definitely, I thought we were way prepared in terms of inventory and we were not. We sold like tens of thousands, got tens of thousands of orders um, within that first 24 hours. We sold out of all our deodorant in, I think, like seven hours. Um, and I thought we had more than enough and we did not. Um, so it was sold out. We had this like 15,000 person wait list. Um, and I, I think one of the things I was most underprepared about and all, overall our episode was fantastic. Like 
they gave me a great edit. Like it was super positive. Like I've gotten so many DMs and messages from people being like, I'm so inspired by you. Like da, 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 da. it's like, it's been really, really awesome. I'm really grateful for how it all turned out. And then I wasn't one of those people that got like torn apart on Shark Tank. <laughs> um, no, but it's, you, were, you were amazing. Like uh, I, I, also, I particularly loved how, you know, when you're, uh, when you were pitching and you were actually, I think, uh, speaking to um, one of the other sharks, uh, how Mark Cuban starts talking to Barbara uh, Corcoran and, she, and he goes like, I'm going to invest in her. Like, I, I, I didn't, like, it's not, a, it, it's clear that he's not necessarily interested in the deal. Yeah, he's like, I don't care about the business, I want to invest in her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. And I, and if I'm being like honest, like not trying to cheat my own horn, but I, after I filmed, so like you're in the shark tank for an hour uh, or I was in there charting for an hour and then you finish and then they like take you back to your trailer and you can like change and stuff. And I was there alone because I don't have a co-founder and it's COVID. So they weren't allowed. Normally I think they allow you to bring like your family, but, um, cause of COVID I was just by myself and like, they took me back to my trailer. And I just remember like so vividly just being like overwhelmed. Like I could not believe, I was sure that I was going to go on Shark Tank and get like torn apart because they hate like competitive businesses. I don't have any patents. Like they don't like when you've raised money before. And I raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. Like they, I had watched enough of the show to know that like, oh God, like they might be really tough on me. And the the fact that they were not tough on me at all they were so complimentary they were so nice and I got a deal with Mark Cuban and Barbara Corcoran I was like I just got back to my trailer and like broke down and was like oh my god I cannot believe that this just happened to me like I'm still in shock like how perfect it turned out um anyways I can't even remember what you just asked me but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that actually brings me to my next question which is how um how much due diligence do the sharks do before the deal uh, and also after because i've also heard of times when they've committed to invest at the show but then there is a due diligence process that happens at, right afterwards correct yeah, yeah 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 so we you commit on the show it's a handshake deal um so obviously they don't share like terms and everything with you on the show right then and there it's just exactly what you see on the show is what happens um and then you walk off and then the next week they um the next week they um they reach out to you they're the sharks like lawyers or business managers and stuff reach out to you and they start the diligence process and so the diligence process is like similar to normal vc where they ask for financials your like financial model all that stuff um and it was actually even more detailed it was they asked for like our contracts with soul cycle like this and that like they asked for a lot um and then you get to do diligence as well and like we got the term sheet and reviewed it with our lawyer ultimately we decided it wasn't a fit for us um just the once we got into the nitty-gritty of the terms we um decided not to take the deal um but we ended up working out a deal i really wanted to work with barbara corcoran she um she was kind of my goal, um, shark. And so I worked out, ended up working out an agree, an arrangement with her. Um, and so she's on our cap table and she's really involved. So it worked out kind of for the best. We ended up not taking that deal, um, to kind of preserve my, my ownership and my control, and then ended up kind of getting the best of both worlds and still having Barbara involved. That's amazing. That's good to yeah. know because it is, I mean, I feel from the outside, um, you don't really know how these things work out. So there is enough yeah. time for you to think about the terms um, and also not, not accept them. Uh, you're not held to any sort of like, it's good to know that you're not held to any, um, yeah. uh, you know, you, like, that you have to sign. Definitely not. I think a lot of, I've heard, like I've read articles that like yeah. a lot of, I think like more than half of the deals fall through after the show. Um, but that's like, cause you don't have the full picture. It's not, you know, it's not like they're investing on a standard, like why combinator safe note. Like there's a lot of terms in there that you 
don't learn about when you're standing there on the carpet that for us, we decided it wasn't going to work for us. So, um, nobody's tied to anything. Um, again, the show was like, I, I loved working like there, the way the show was run is really, um, entrepreneur friendly and, um, the staff and everything. Like I just, I had overall great experience. If anyone has an opportunity to go on shark tank, take it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was going to ask that. Would you recommend it? I'll do I it. absolutely would. They are, they are so awesome. Like I learned so much through the process. Um, their team is just like, felt like a family, like everyone afterwards, like when I walked out of the shark tank was like hugging me. And, um, it was like, it was really overall a very positive experience. And then working with Barbara has been amazing. Like I'm going to New York in two weeks and we're doing like a half day together. And, um, she's been really really helpful. Wow. Um, I have some questions here in the chat that I want to make sure that I'm not missing. Uh, someone says, if you could change, uh, one thing about the early bootstrap days, what would you have done differently? Um, would you, would you recommend bootstrapping? Um, if you can, did you, cause I know a lot of, a lot of founders are trying, you know, when they're in the super early days. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you can, I would like, I think the biggest, obviously the bootstrap days were really hard. Um, cause I was like competing against again, big budgets and like beautiful brands that had these amazing brand photography and they had agencies and this and that. And like, I, it was me. Um, and I also didn't know anything about the industry. So I guess like my one, if I don't regret what I did, like the way I did it, but I, if I were to give anyone else advice, (coughs) like get some, at least a little experience before you do it. Um, I think I would have moved a lot faster if I had had previous experience. So I, anyone that's like looking to start a CPG business, like go work for a CPG brand for a year. Uh, if you're starting a SaaS company, like go work for a SaaS company for a year. It doesn't even matter what department, like if it's a startup, you'll learn everything. So that's something I kind of wish I had done is like spent a year at a, at a D to C brand before I launched a D to C brand. But, um, I, I mean, I, I learned as I went, like, I think that the first like year, even two years was kind of like my MBA. Um, I went from knowing nothing to like really just learning as I went, I have always been big on like networking and creating a network and, that's paid dividends. Like I have such a great founder network that I can lean on for advice for anything. And like every service provider we use from our lawyer to our PR firm, like came from an introduction from my network um, of people I trust. So that's a big piece of advice. Like start cultivating your network in whatever space you're in like now. Um, Cause that network is everything. Um, I also, another piece of advice is like, don't listen to people. Don't like take the advice of people. First of all, I never take the advice of people. Like if someone tells you like, you should be doing this, like use your own brain. Like I, I think in the early days, someone would be like, you, you should try this. It worked for us. And then I'd like go out there and do it and then be bummed that it didn't work. You have to like put it through the lens of like, you know, your business better than anyone. Like just because it worked for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. I made that mistake a lot. Um, listen to your, like take fight advice, take feedback, but like ultimately you're the the decision maker and you know, what's going to work best. But, um, another thing, another piece of advice and something I didn't do was don't, especially in CPG. And if you're building a brand in general, um, a direct to consumer brand, things change so fast. Like I would often get advice from someone that built a business and sold it. Like one of my friends like built his company and sold it in 2018. Um, and he, you know, gave me all this advice on where to spend, what, what marketing channels worked, et cetera. And like, literally, if you built a business in 2018, 
you're, you were operating in a totally different world then than you are now. TikTok wasn't around. Facebook CPMs were like 50 cents or something crazy. Like it was a different world. So what worked then, it's like a totally different like blueprint than if you're building a brand today. So that's like a general piece of advice is like take, if you're going to get advice and feedback, do it from people who are building right now. Don't, don't like take any person's advice that built a brand five years ago or two years ago with a grain of salt because we're operating in like a totally different time. Like we're in the post iOS 14 world. We're in the TikTok world. Like no one's building a brand. Pandemic. Facebook. Yeah. Post pandemic world. It's a totally <laughs> different world. So like that's um, you can get some bad advice from people who might be well-intentioned that just were operating in a different time. That is, that is very good advice. Um, how, so I have another question uh, in my DMs. How did you learn about logistics uh, specifically when it comes to, you said you were getting product from China. Yeah. I learned, (laughs) I learned everything as I went, like everything and um, logistics included. Um, So you just have to kind of, if you're a fast learner and I think if you're going to be bootstrapped and like not have a big team, not being able to hire a big team, like you have to be curious and you have to be a fast learner. And so anything, you know, all right, I guess I'm going to figure out this weekend how you get pallets from China. And I would just like, you know, tap into my network, try to ask people for advice. And then I'd get intros to a freight forwarder. And then I'd talk to the freight forwarder and then talk to another one. And I'd next thing I knew, I'd be like, all right, I know what I'm doing. And I would do it. Um, and that's like true for everything. Like I didn't know anything coming into it. Like I have learned everything on the job, <laughs> but also made a lot of mistakes as a result, but that's kind of part of the Yeah. Um, so you're bootstrapped, you're doing everything on your own. Um, who were your first hires? And what is your recommendation for an early state founder, you know, running a DTC business? Like what is the most key? A hundred percent customer support. Like if that was our first hire and that should be your first hire um, because customer support gets out of control really fast um, and it's not a good use of your time. And for us, like customer support, our customer support has been like our superpower. Like if you look at our reviews on our website, like one in five of our reviews mentions our customer support. Like it's a big part of our brand. Um, I've always been a big Zappos fan. So like kind of learned that from them, like just it like, I blows my mind when I order something from a company, like a direct to consumer brand. And I like reach out to their customer support and they're like cold or they're like unwilling to help me, or they won't accept a return because it's outside of the window. I'm like, we pay so much money to acquire customers. Like it's so short-sighted to like not do everything in your power to keep that person. So our customer support is like fantastic. I'm so proud of it. And it like warms my heart, like seeing people, like seeing the responses, um, the response to that hard work. Cause our customer support team is just like their whole mission is just like make people happy, make people feel heard and understood. And like, you know, if we have to replace a product cause they don't like the scent and like we send them a new one for free, like that is going to pay off in the future. Like having that level of support where we're like, we're going to take care of you. Like we will pay to replace your product. You don't even have to ship us the original one back because we want you to be happy that bad. Um, That just like pays off and it it has for us. So number one hire is customer support and someone that's empathetic and compassionate and articulate and can communicate with your customers um, in the way that you want them to. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I can totally see that. How, and and so sorry, Moyes, um, the founder of Native um, has become a a friend of mine and he, um, I, I didn't know him when I was starting out, but 
I was getting coffee with him a couple months ago and he was like, uh, he mentioned that his first hire was customer support. And I was like, that was our first hire too. And it's, um, it is very important. Like, and I think a lot of people cheap out on it. And I'm like, that's not the role to like outsource to some like 20 year old or put, you know, outsource like overseas, like that person should be part of your team. And like, it's very much part of your brand. So that represents your brand. So pay them well, and like find someone great. <laughs> that is a great, great point. Uh, I like Rory's comment here, customer retention for the win. Yeah. Uh, anybody who's ever run an e-commerce business uh, or a brand will tell you that that's. Yes. I'm like, I don't want a robot doing my customers work. Like, why would I ever, ever do that? Like, that just makes no sense. Um, um, love that. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have only a few more minutes left. So I want to make sure we cover a couple of other questions. So moving yeah. on to, you know, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a female founder. Um, and what would you, I mean, you are building a product for for women, correct? Like Curie is for, for women. We, so we actually are, have mostly been for women, but, um, 18% of our customers are men. Um, and so I think it's because of our, we've gotten a lot of male customers from our fitness studios because we're in the men's and women's locker rooms. Um, so I think like, and a lot of our customers, like will say, oh, I bought, I bought one for my husband too. So we do have male customers. So we are coming out with a scent um, in June when we launch with that big fitness studio that's, um, it's a juniper eucalyptus and it's gonna be like our masculine scent. So we're doing a specific like male scent soon. Amazing. Um, what would you say to other uh founders, uh, women who, who, you know, want to start something and are, you know, afraid of, or, um, afraid of failure. Like what is the sort of holding them back? What is your advice to them? Yeah. I mean, if you're, I feel like that, cause I had a lot of ideas before I started Curie, um, that I didn't pursue. And I feel like for me, and I don't know, like for me, it was, a lot of the time I would, I felt like, first of all, starting a company is a very vulnerable place to be. Like you're like putting something out into the world. Um, and I think I, a lot of, a big part of me was like always scared of like what people would think. Like if I started a deodorant company, I was even scared with Curie. Like if I started a deodorant company, like people would be like, wait, what? Like Sarah's starting a deodorant company. Like, what does she know about this? Like, I just was always scared. Of, and I think a lot of people can relate to that fear of like, are people going to think this is weird? Are people going to like make fun of me? Are people going to da 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 And like a lot of people did, like even my own family members were like, what? Like you're, 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 why? Like, what do you, why do you want to do this? Um, and so it, that's like one hurdle is just like, you have to believe in what you're doing so much that like, you don't care. Um, and then ultimately, like once you get success, like no one's going to think that anymore. So just like do it and, you know, put yourself in that vulnerable position. Um, because once you have some success, like no one is going to question you anymore. <laughs> um, but then in terms of the fear, like I definitely had the fear a lot, like fear of failure. Um, but I, there was actually one book I read, um, that really helped me like, cause part of the reason I was ran Curie bootstrapped and as a side hustle that first year was partly because of fear. Like I didn't want to put my name behind this and go raise money and then fail. Um, and I also didn't want to like quit my job because I was like scared that what if we failed and then I would have nothing. And so I was like 11 months in to Curie and we were like growing, but not like crazy. I think we did in our first year, like $140,000 in sales. Um, and we were like, you know, on the up and up, but I wasn't, I didn't have time to really put into marketing or anything. And so I, but I listened to um, shoe dog by Phil Knight, um, the founder of Nike. And mm -hmm. I listened to the audiobook. Um, and that 
like really helped me. Um, I highly recommend that book for anybody because he went through like some crazy struggles um, to get Nike off the ground. And he, I just, that book, there was like a specific quote that I remember like writing it down and reading it over and over again about like, you're never gonna, I would I knew I would never regret um, if I tried and failed. Like I would just regret like not going all in because he was also kind of doing it as a side hustle too in the yeah. beginning. And I, I remember just being like, if I just continue doing this for years, like Curie is never going to grow if I'm not, if it doesn't have resources and team to help, um, like bring it to the next level. And so that was shortly after that, I quit my job and raised some money and, um, went all in. Oh, I love that book too. It's one of my favorite um, so good. books. Like, and obviously crazy. it's also about running, it also talks a lot about his passion for running and how he sort of married the two, which is just so inspiring. Yeah, it's so good. I actually want to like listen to it again. It was like now because <laughs> um, it really did have a big impact on me. Uh, which is actually the perfect segue for my next question. What's who who inspires you? Uh, in terms of like entrepreneurs that inspire me, um, or like, you know, people I really look up to Sarah Blakely was always one of them. Um, I really, really respect her. Uh, and she, honestly, I remember reading like in a Forbes or some article in a magazine back when magazines were something that we read often um, and like tore out the set. There was like a whole feature on her and I like tore it out and like kept it because I was like, that's so cool. Like her story was kind of similar to mine where, I mean, the outcome was different. <laughs> Maybe mine will get there, but yeah, you'll get there. We're on our way. But um, she like was selling fax machines door to door. She started Spanx in her home. And like I started Spanx in my or Carrie in my apartment. And like she, um, you know, was like had that similar like hustle that I've had where I'm like, I'm just going to reach out to Nordstrom six times until they say yes to me. Like that was her mentality too with like retailers. She would just be like, okay, how about now? How about now? How about now? Like, and so she, down. <laughs> she was just like, so tenacious. And like, I, I just love her. So she's definitely someone I look up to. And she's just like, seems like a good person. Like she's never had a scandal. She's never like, you, you don't hear about her being a monster to her employees. Like she just genuinely seems like a good person that deserves like the success that she's had. So she's my biggest, um, like entrepreneur idol. Um, and then obviously like after reading shoe dog, like Phil Knight, incredible, um, built an incredible company. I can't really think of anyone else though. Um, That's right so now, like in terms of businesses, like and entrepreneurs that I think are like killing it, that I really respect and look up to now. Um, I think the brand summer Fridays is like hmm. amazing. Like the founders of summer Fridays have like been so smart about, how they've like built and grown that company. Um, and then also Hero Cosmetics, uh, mm -hmm. Ju, uh, the founder, she bootstrapped and built this like little acne patch business on Amazon a couple of years ago. And now she's doing hundreds of millions in sales and has built this like behemoth, like skincare, you know, kind of proactive competitor um, that it's like, amazing. I met her years ago when she was still teeny tiny. And now it's just been like really inspiring to see how much she's grown. Love it. There's one last question here, which I want to ask, like sort of, yeah. Um, add. we, you talked earlier about falling back on your network, having these, you know, solid like founder, uh, uh, friends, uh, that you could always go to talk to. Um, and how did you get to choose the village. Lisa asked the way, how did you choose the village to help you get to where you are now? Because I understand, and you know, we 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 have a community of female founders, uh, of and they are what we hear often is that it's a very lonely journey. Um, you don't, you know, not not necessarily do you have uh, a privilege enough to have that kind of network. Um, and so, how do you actively go choose find 
you know, people, mentors, uh, other founders that are uh, ahead of your uh, journey? Um, yeah. To keep Good that- question. I think I have an advantage because I live in LA and like LA is, I think LA and New York are like two kind of centers of like the, the CPG, like D to C um, brand communities. Uh, I started Curie when I lived in San Francisco and it was definitely like a very different place to like, to start a company in San Francisco was really tough. If, if I was a tech company, it would have been amazing, but there weren't a lot of like health and wellness and brand consumer brands in San Francisco. So it was really hard to build a network there. And that's ultimately like a big reason why I moved down to LA. Um, I, I know I said I had been at a venture fund down here, but then I did a brief stint, like stint back in San Francisco, um, right around when I was starting Curie and then moved back. So I've gone back and forth like four times, but I'm definitely staying here. Um, so being in LA is definitely an advantage. So like, if you're not in LA or New York, I definitely like would recommend like trying to do a visit to New York or LA like once a quarter just to like maintain your network because there's just so many events and like every week I go to a dinner or a networking event or a conference or something happy hour um and you a lot of that stuff you do have to like be there in person for and you can continue those relationships offline like phone calls and stuff but it's I think nothing replaces like being in person so that's what I did. Like when I was living in San Francisco, I would just come down. I had one of my best friends was living here and had, and so I would just stay with her for a couple of nights and try to like network and get coffee and meet people and go to events and stuff like that. Um, so New York and LA are great for that. And then also Twitter has been fantastic. Like I've made such a amazing network through Twitter. I haven't met most of them. So if you can't, if you don't have the flexibility to go to New York and LA once a quarter, like you can also just create a network on Twitter just by following people in CPG, like, or whatever your industry is following them on Twitter and then just start tweeting. Like I just tweet like a lot and it's, my network has grown and grown and grown. And I get people reaching out in my DMs like, hey, like, would love to chat. I'm starting this, da da da, da. I'll hop on the fo- a call with them or meet for coffee. And then like, boom, now a new person in my network. Um, so it just kind of happens like over time. You can't really force it all at once. You're not going to have a boom, a big network in a week. But if you put time into it consistently, um, within a year or two, you can create a network in whatever industry you want, I think. Yeah, thank you. So you got to keep putting yourself out there, I think, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. And like, even um, now, TikTok, I just got on TikTok in January. Um, Curie has been on TikTok, but I created my personal TikTok, which is Sarah J. Moray. Um, and I had, I was like, join this like 30 day TikTok challenge in January. And I posted consistently for 30 days. And now I have like 7,000 followers and like a huge, like people that are like reaching out to me, they're buying my products. They're like messaging me. They're connecting me to people. Like it's been, now I have this whole TikTok network too. So just putting yourself out there and like I just think that's the biggest part of it is just putting yourself out there and making yourself like part of the conversation. And then eventually like you'll become part of the conversation. Awesome. Well, I know we are at time. The very last question for you, what's next for Curie and how can we support you? How can, you know, everybody watching today support you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, of course you can buy our products, curiebond.com. We're currently um, still sold out of our deodorant, but we just opened up pre-order. Um, so that's the most obvious way, but also um, buying on our retailer websites. Like anytime my friends are like, how can I support you? I'm like, go buy our products on Nordstrom.com because we want them to love us. And the way a retailer loves you is it yeah, we move products. So um, buy our products at retailers if you see them or if you go online. Next time you're making a purchase at Nordstrom or Bloomingdale's, add a Curie product to your cart. Um, and then just, um, yeah, follow me on Twitter. And if you're in my industry, like 
drop a line, DM me. <laughs> um, and I'm always happy to, to, you know, add to my network. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank, thank you, you guys so much. And sorry, I, I couldn't hop in on the chat, but I've read every message and um, this was really fun and great questions, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, for the time, everybody listening in. Um, we are Graham and Walker uh, accepting applications for our next uh, Catalyst program happening in June. Um, our Catalyst is a two week fundraising readiness program. So if you are, uh, you know, if you're in that place, you want to learn about fundraising, apply now, uh, apply before um, April 29th and we will review your application. And, just and then a couple of people asked about where to watch Shark Tank. Um, <laughs> the full episode is not on Hulu anymore. They like, it had it was only up there for like six weeks uh or um three weeks um but you can watch it on abc.com if you have cable or um i think amazon prime video or you can watch like a short clip of the episode like the last two or three minutes of it if you just go on youtube and search like curie shark tank um you can at least watch a clip Awesome. We'll we'll include uh uh you know those links in our in our email um after the show and yeah cool. Everybody Thanks has. guys. Thanks Sarah. Bye. Bye.